Today's podcast is brought to you by Isoway Sports, the sports range for athletes looking for supplements that are free from all artificial colours, flavours, sweeteners and added fructose. Intense physical training programs place significantly higher nutritional demands on sports people, and Isoway Sports are committed to providing pure nutritional ingredients that are truly complementary to a healthy, active lifestyle. You can visit isoasports.com.au for more information. This is FX Medicine, and I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. And with me on the line today is Dr. Janet Schloss. Now, Janet's been in private practice as a nutritionist and naturopath for over 15 years and is in the final stages of her doctorate before publication at the School of Medicine at the University of Queensland through the Princess Alexandra Hospital or PA Hospital in Brisbane. She's also lectured at the Endeavour College of Natural Medicine for over 11 years and she's recently started part-time as a research officer, surveys and statistics in the Office for Research for Endeavour College. Janet's main speciality is with people who have cancer, especially those going through uh, traditional treatment. Janet's long been involved in research about cancer and nutrition, particularly for individuals going through chemotherapy and radiation. Janet's also well known as an author in naturopathic circles, having written for Henry Osiki for a number of years, and she's also written a number of publications to her name involving complementary medicine, cancer and chronic diseases. And today we'll be talking about something close to Janet's heart and mine, and that's the antioxidant myth. So welcome, Janet. Thank you, Andy. That was a really nice introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, your, uh, your bio is getting longer and longer by the month. I know. <laughs> now, Janet, you know, your speciality, as we know from previous podcasts for our listeners, has been with supporting people through their cancer therapy. And that's your true area of expertise. But you've also delved into a research area that's quite controversial, and that's the antioxidant myth, and, and, and there's a lot going on in this area. So I think first, can you explain this theory that we're discussing today? Was the antioxidant theory of ageing as simple as compounds which can accept a free electron and thereby quenching the free electron's ability to create instability in molecules? The answer to that would be actually no. And like, obviously, this is is close to my heart, and particularly also for my supervisor, which is Louis Fatetta, and him and um, Anthony Lanane have put years into researching this antioxidant theory. And unfortunately, it's one of the the biggest areas uh, of research that is done by in, um, like under a microscope, which is in vitro versus in vivo, looking at what actually happens in humans. Hmm. So we all believe that these compounds that we get in foods, nutrients, you know, herbs, a whole range of different things, um, neutralize free radicals by either like donating an electron or putting it back, like if there's like a, um, a hyperactivity occurring to help neutralize that. But that does actually occur. However, it's just a name and there cannot be uh, an over production of free radicals that causes cellular oxidation or oxidative stress unless there is an induced situation. Our bodies are physiologically very well regulated and all these things are required for our body to actually function properly. So what we're talking about is reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species, um, which we consider to be free radicals, which are supposed to be like the baddies in our body. However, they're actually required for normal cellular activity. And as is antioxidants, which is just a name that we've given to certain nutrients and things that actually occur or biochemical reactivities that occur in the body. So in most cases in our body, we don't actually have oxidative stress unless it's an induced situation. So this is where I get confused because aren't we, when we're talking about disease processes, aren't we talking about an induced situation? Not necessarily. A disease itself doesn't actually cause an induced situation. We have natural uh, body reactions like your your inflammatory pathways, which can actually happen in diseases. Um, uh, 
we have higher blood sugar regulation that can actually cause cellular damage, those type of things. It's not necessarily what actually happens in disease. People in disease believe that we have this higher production of free radicals that then overpower your mitochondria and cellular activities and causes damage and then that the body can actually function with these not working at an optimal level. Well, the body can't do that. Um, body obviously isn't perfect. So we have a mistake and we do have um, some form of cellular damage to our mitochondria. The mitochondria will actually go into apoptosis and die. The same thing with the cell. If we have too many damaged um, proteins or um, different organelles within the actual cell or even on the cellular um, membrane, the cell will go into apoptosis and die. There's no way that a cell can actually function under optimal um, conditions. So, And to have an organ or a disease that actually occurs, that you would need to have an excessive amount of cellular uh, cells to die to actually cause that particular disease. It doesn't happen. So, now, we talk, so we're talking about a switch mechanism. Like, um, I guess this is the area where I get confused, where I'm a bit fuzzy, like I'm not sure about my knowledge here, and, and that is... Are we talking about either a well organelle or mitochondria or it's dead? Or is there areas of grey where it's, you know, under stress and dying there and, and is, recoverable? I mean, there's no ever black and white. But um, a mitochondria is not recoverable. So it will either be functional. As soon as it's not functional, it will actually die. So it cannot function when even on the way that it's actually dying. It will actually just... Um, Die, the body will then eliminate it right. out of that particular cell. So, so let's go right back in time. How was this theory created? Like, why did it even start? Uh, there's been um, different things that have been challenged. And obviously, when we're looking into science, and stuff, there's been a whole range of different things that have been hypothesized. And um, this whole thing on antioxidants actually started in 1956 with Harmon. And he hypothesized that like a free radical production from oxygen intake actually caused uh, a, the aging process. So it made us age. So it caused our, our organs to decrease. We caused degenerative de degrees, uh, disease and all those type of things. And it caused um, problems with our DNA and different proteins in our connective tissue. So he looked at it in, um, under a microscope. And um, to actually get this, because I did an extensive man, amount of experiments, to actually get that damage, they actually had to increase the amount of free radicals to actually cause the organelles to die or to have damage. That doesn't actually happen within our body. Um, then uh, Bobris and Chant in 1973 actually demonstrated a large amount of superoxide if it was generated by mitochondrial electron transport chain, actually can cause um, oxidative stress. Now, we know that along the electron transport chain, um, obviously there is a lot of free radicals, but they're actually required for that reaction to actually occur. So um, it's not actually toxic to cells, which is what um, the theory that they, these guys actually produced, mm. saying that you know if it's overproduced, then the cell's actually going to die because you need the antioxidants to counteract that. Again, that was an interest, interest, um, in vitro study yeah. and it, it is not actually what actually happens. The CoQ10, which is in, in there, which we see as a, an antioxidant, which is what they portrayed, actually turns into a pro-oxidant in the oxidative phosphorylation series mm. and actually helps with that ele electron um, to be supported along that chain. So it's actually a required thing with the ROS. Yeah, so this is where I think I'm on the right track, and that is, you know, for instance, in the industry, in, in the supplement industry, we've had coenzyme Q10 ubiquinone for years, but now yeah. we have ubiquinol, its redox partner. So right. is one now bad? <laughs> you know, this is the... They're not. They're just redox partners. They're not, because our body just um, turns them into what it requires. Yeah. And I, I remember... More, I remember. It's more, it's more about absorption. Yes. So I, I remember an email I, I sent um, Associate Professor Lewis Viteta, um some years ago now, and I said, so should we maybe be calling them redoxidants? And he very quickly replied, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. And, you know, he calls them cellular um, messages, and I actually think that's a really good name. Yeah. And the, the our free radicals are what you see them, like our ROS and all that type of stuff. Our antioxidants are all cellular messages. They're all required for those cells to actually 
function. Yeah. But this is, again, though, where I get a little bit muddy, and that is can't the antioxidant theory coexist with how these compounds work on a more biochemical level as messengers? Can't it sort of, can't they both be coexistent? Yeah, absolutely. Like if we like what we've done is just give them a name and and it can coexist. So yes, it does actually happen. Yes, they do um, donate electrons. Yes, we do actually produce free radicals. It's just a name. But what what has actually been um, dis, like disputed is that we need to give all these antioxidants to quench these free radicals because they're so bad and they're going to cause damage, which is not the case. Right. So it's so, the actual... yes, we can still call them antioxidants. Yes, we can still call them free radicals, but neither's good and neither's bad. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, un- unless certain situations occur where it's an overwhelming issue, and we'll get to that later, um, mostly we're talking about a normal biochemical process. Yes. Exactly. It's just a normal biochemical process that's in, that happens in every cell within our bodies every day, multitudes of times. And it, our bodies are so well regulated. And like I said, the only time that that um, is changed is when we actually have an, an induced situation, say like radiation. So let's talk about radiation. What happens in that Where and, and why is it different from this antioxidant theory of ageing? The antioxidant age, the theory of aging actually just talks about our normal physiological activity, which is what we've just discussed. But radiation is an induced situation, so you're putting a high amount of rays into certain cells. In doing so, it speeds up the reaction and actually causes cellular damage. In in that, what what actually happens? And it is what's called oxidative stress. So all our antioxidants turn into prooxidants. And the free radicals are then over overrunning that particular cell, and they die. Again, it can't exist in a in a subclinical situation. They all all die. So the cells die, and like the that area will actually go into apoptosis and cause cause fibrosis adhesions, which then afford, therefore the cells can't actually reproduce. Which is why radiation is done in those instances around. Um, if they don't have a tumour, to actually prevent cellular replication. So there's no cellular replication that can actually occur because obviously the DNA is actually damaged and the cells are damaged, which is where you get fibrosis and adhesions. If they're trying to reduce the tumours, again, it's the same thing. They're actually inducing apoptosis in those particular cells and around that area. So this is where, you know, and, and forgive me for playing devil's advocate here, Janet. No, it's you're just more that, than welcome. Well, it's just that I need to clear it up in my brain because I'm sort of still there. I'm still trying to grasp it. I think I'm there and then I think about another concept and I go, hang on. So my next question for you is about, well, what should we be talking about then? Have we got it wrong about oxidised LDL, trans fats and, you know, the browning of apples? I mean, aren't these signs of oxidation? There's a difference between oxidation when it, when something is actually exposed to oxygen on the outside, and if, if an apple browns, yes, that is actually oxidation, because that that those cells within that apple are actually dying, and we're actually seeing that apoptosis process. See, our insides aren't exposed to oxygen unless it's in that obviously that regulated environment. So so that explains trans fats and browning of apples. But what about oxidised LDL causing plaques? Yeah, I don't believe that actually occurs. I think that there's much more to that like theory. I don't think that the LDLs are actually oxidised. Um, I think that there is, they can be, um, because they're actually circulating, I'm trying to work out the bit, what's the best way to say this is, but it's because of the way that they're actually circulating. If there is some sort of, of break within that artery or vein, mostly in arteries, obviously, um, then or calcification, which can actually occur, so depositing on that type of stuff. I think the LDLs can actually get caught and then actually can change their their molecular structure and then help cause a plaque. I don't think it's what we call as oxidation because I don't think you can actually oxidize um, completely because they can re rechange within the, the structure themselves. It's, uh, it's, it's like seriously, it's something I just don't get. You know, because all of these other ones are uh, ex vivo, or, you know, or in vitro. Um, but and I understand that. That to me is a very simple explanation. That I get it. But then we get these things that do occur in vivo, and I'm still struggling to grasp that it's not an electron trapper. 
<laughs> you know what I, I mean? don't believe it's an electron trap. But that's yeah. the thing. Like I think with the LDLs, it's not just about uh, um, the electrons being donated and not coming back, and then that the LDLs are actually oxidized. You know, I think what they're actually testing is just a natural process that actually happens within the body, and they're saying that it's a bad thing. So, um, because there is a continual turnover that does actually occur. So, Janet, you, you spoke about these compounds rather being an, rather than being antioxidants that we should be calling them cellular messengers, but that's a pretty broad brush stroke. What should we be calling these compounds as a group? Or indeed, should we be grouping them together or should we just be referring to them as their name and their action? Well, I think there's, that's a, a double barrel question. I think that we can call them uh, cellular messages, but we can then do sub, we can subgroup them into different actions because both of them are actually required, you know. So, and we do have a lot of our, what we could call antioxidants are also pro-oxidants within the body. They have both similar roles and, and both are actually required. So we can't just call them antioxidants because they're also pro-oxidants and that would actually just confuse a lot of the public. Whereas the free radicals themselves is just obviously a, a redox ability of that particular molecule. So on a broad scale, we can probably, we can just call them uh, cellular messages and on a subscale because of like it's been around for so long, people know them as antioxidants. We can still call them antioxidants, an antioxidant cellular messenger and free radical cellular messenger. And that's probably the easiest way for people to actually get their head around it. So it's not necessarily that we ditch the term antioxidants or free radical altogether. It's just that we need to add on something to sort of explain their action more. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. Like one of the things that I, I guess I have a, a personal thing about is that people say, oh, you need to take this because it has antioxidant ability. Well, anything can have an antioxidant ability. Yeah. I think what we need to do is actually look deeper and see what their mechanism of action is. Does it have an anti-inflammatory activity? Which one does it, you know, does it decrease TNF alpha? Does it actually work on this particular biochemical process? So I think what we need to do, instead of having this broad marketing type term mm. as an antioxidant, yep. we actually we ditch that and we say this works by this particular action. So I, th- I think maybe this um, is a call to industry to start validating not just the supposed molecular activity of it, which may or may not be true, but more to validate its action on biochemical processes. Yes, Absolutely. And I think that, like, we should be at a point now, like, particularly because we, we're wanting registration, we, we need, well, actually, we need registration, mm. and um, we need to be more biochemically and scientifically correct. Yeah. And I know there's a lot of scientists who are looking into the antioxidant theories and all those types of things too, but instead of having this broad thing saying antioxidant, industry does actually require saying, no, this actually works by this mechanism, this mechanism, this mechanism. And and I think this is it's also a need to validate that it actually works to exactly. to change some biochemical process for the betterment of the patient. So, you know, talking about preclinical studies, we need to first validate that the that the compound has an activity in the direction that we want to go, and then finally, Absolutely. we actually need to make sure that patients benefit from these things. Yes, I, I totally agree with that because you know, obviously, I'm into research and stuff like that but uh, I think we need to do a lot more preclinical skills I think we need to validate a lot that of our products and that these compounds do actually have these these particular activities because you know th- even when they do reviews you will actually find that a certain amount of studies actually find a negative response now why is that you know, and there's still a lot of unanswered questions. This has been an area of interest for me is that, you know, why or how can an antioxidant be so positive in one study and so negative in or, or nil effect in another? It, it doesn't ring true. I, I get the fact that, you know, when just by purely science, you know, when you look at larger groups, some things might be artifact and they might yes. just be a chance finding. I, I understand that. But when you look at some of these studies and they have such a strong effect in one study and no effect in another, I start to question the first study. Yes. So... One of the arguments we were just talking about is, you know, why is there that positive test and then some of the negative tests? It was really, really interesting. Um, 
the New Liberia and Ross in 2012 actually did an argument that excessive consumption of administered antioxidants can actually overwhelm our cellular function of ROS and therefore actually cause or decrease biological function within different cells. So they did a review and what they actually found was that nine trials indicated no effect from antioxidant supplementation. Six trials were found to have harmful effects and then there were 12 that actually said that they had beneficial effects. And I think what actually comes down to it is that we as individuals have our own makeup. By giving an excessive amount of supplementation where not needed, it may actually cause some form of different biochemical approaches which we don't know yet which is where we're looking at in vivo. Um, and in, but in some people, that it's actually required, so they will actually have a beneficial effect. So how to tell? Who, who, how do you tell? That's the thing. We don't know yet. But that's where we have to work out. I mean, just giving a broad people the same supplement may not actually be right. And this is where it comes down to, I think, individual treatment prescription. And certain... And that's why I said knowing those those compounds and what their actually activity is means that we can be more specific and say, you know, this is the right thing for you for this period of time, mm. but it's not the right thing for this other person. Whereas in some of the trials, it's just given across the board. So, you know, it's to- not an individualized program. Yeah. Well, I wholeheartedly support individualized programs. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that that is, I think, one of the main reasons why we see some of these negative effects in, in studies, why sometimes things work and sometimes things don't. They may not actually have the, the right target population um, that is actually required. And we're not looking at, okay, this person, this is not just because it's an antioxidant, it's because it has this particular activity and this person actually needs it, but this person doesn't. So do you think maybe that, nutritional medicine or or indeed naturopathic practice could ever reach a population basis due to biochemical individuality it would have like that i think that's one of the problems with studies and the same thing goes for medicine too obviously medicine and pharmaceutical drugs have a particular action in some cases a lot strong well it always a lot stronger than what we have for nutrients but I think we have the ability, but we have our in inclusion and exclusion criteria has to be very strict to to show that we're going to get that particular benefit or ne- um, negativity from that from that compound. Mm. So yeah, I do think it's I do think it's possible. You know, I might point out. You know, there's this assumption that pharmaceutical drugs work on the majority of people. We're talking like 70, 80 percent odd-ish. Um, but okay. uh, that's not necessarily the case. I remember a comment and I think it was, I, I can't, I'm not going to state the company, but it was by a major pharmaceuticals medical director and it was some years ago. And my memory of the comment was that drugs work on around about 30 percent of people. That's not to say they don't work but they don't work at 80%. They work at 30%. And I'm like, wow. (laughs) So that brings your number to treat up, doesn't it? (laughs) It does, and that's exactly right. And that's what we're doing also with nutrients and herbs and all those types of things as well. You know, they're putting out their thing on randomised clinical trials onto us, and which is fine. We can actually do that. But they also have to realise it, like, and we know that not it's not going to work on everybody. What was your slam dunk comment? Do you think that you made at the NHAA conference where it was like hell yeah, this is, <laughs> um, that clinched you the prize? <laughs> the reason I think it is is that I challenged normal thought patterns and actually showed that. Just because we get told everything, it doesn't mean that it's always right. So, Janet, where do we head? Where do we go with this theory now? Well, I actually think we need re-education, and that's going to take a long time. You know, we're still under this thing about the antioxidants, and until industry take it on that, you know, maybe we don't call it this big antioxidant need like we've just been talking about. Maybe we need to actually be more specific in activity. We know that this is cellular messages. We need to start changing people's thought processes and or how they actually see this to actually be of function. So uh, to me, the next step is uh, re-education, um, particularly of practitioners. The larger population is obviously going to take a lot longer because um, the marketing of foods and all that type of stuff have all yeah. taken on the antioxidant uh, banner. Yeah. People to get their head around the fact that antioxidants also act as pro-oxidants and that free radicals aren't always bad, it's going to take a while.
Yeah, absolutely. So I've got to now key this into your speciality, which is caring for people who are undergoing cancer therapy. And one of the big no-nos um, in, in oncological therapy is the theory that quote-unquote antioxidants will undo what the chemotherapy or indeed, more importantly, radiotherapy is going to undertake, so thereby undoing the benefit of the therapy. Yes, which is actually incorrect. And um, I, again, it comes along that this belief of antioxidants, the anti, him giving antioxidants in your food or supplements like that cannot undo what the chemotherapy or radiation is doing. The radiation is so strong, there's no way that you could actually produce or have enough antioxidants to super secede the amount of damage that's actually being done for radiation. In chemotherapy, there's hundreds of different chemotherapy activities and it doesn't actually cause uh, a free radical production. You know, they're either binding into your DNA structure. So therefore, when it actually goes to replicate, the cell dies, it's any tubulin activities, you know, the ankylating agents, the mustard agents, all of that actually have a specific action on the cells. It doesn't actually... Um, induce a free radical production to actually kill the cell. It kills the cell because the cell can't replicate from a number of different ways. So by giving antioxidants during chemotherapy or radiation, you can't mitigate um, what they're actually already doing. The antioxidant theory is a myth and um, it, it's not true that antioxidants are going to stop chemotherapy activity or radiation activity, I do think that we need to have further research into it because it's not the antioxidant theory that's causing it. If it is interfering with their activity, it's because of another mechanism of action. And yes, we don't want to, we don't want to stop the chemotherapy activity. We don't want to stop the radiation, but we don't, uh, and that's why we need further research on different compounds to make sure they're not interfering, but we need to understand how they're interfering and why and when we actually give it. So being a lot more specific. And, and indeed, there's a, a couple of papers written by Dr. Keith Block talking yes. about um, antioxidants use during chemo and radiotherapy and showing that there's been no ill effects, ill toward effect. However, I'm going to sort of talk about the poster child of, of cancer support, and that is curcumin. And it's a couple of papers that interest me because there was a 2002 paper, and forgive me, I can't remember the author's name. It was an Indian name. Um, and it was talking about a human breast cancer model and the use of curcumin with cyclophosphamide. And the curcumin tended to undo the benefit action, beneficial action of the cyclophosphamide. However, later studies, um, forgive me, I can't remember the dates, but they're pretty recent, like within the last five, 10 years. Um, show that indeed in, in animal models that the curcumin helps both cyclophosphamide and indeed cisplatin and other drugs, and it actually tends to resensitize those cells to the chemotherapeutic agent. Tell me yes. what's happening here. Again, I think it comes down to actually looking at what and how they analysed uh, the cells and the effect. And... and I think we have to look at the, the dosage that they actually used. Ah, uh, now there's a good key. And like a good example is um, B6 was actually used in a, a study um, when we were looking at cisplatin for chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy, and it was a dose of 300 milligrams a day. It actually helped to decrease the neuropathy but actually interfered with... Um, the chemotherapy. Now, at a lower dose, it was actually found to be a benefit. Right. So I think a lot of it's got to do with the dose administration that we're looking at. And unfortunately, with some of the studies, you know, someone make, comes up with a dose and then it's that's then continued rather than actually doing studies that actually have different ranges of doses to, to see, you know, wh what is the best dose what is the best administration thing? So I think that I think that is what's actually occurred there. So Janet, where do we go to from here? What do we need to change with regards to the antioxidant theory? Okay, 
other than the education which we talked about, I really think on our research and our marketing and what we put out there is, is focus on biochemical processes, not the antioxidant theory. Mm-hmm. Um, for research, I do actually really want to focus on dose ranging to make sure we get the right dose, um, to make sure we have maximum effect, not a reaction or interaction with just any drugs mm-hmm. in general. Yep. We also need to look at potential interactions and also administration. So looking at frequency, timing, what's the best aspect, even the dose per um, body weight that's actually required. But most of all, what we need to do is make sure does it help our patients because if it doesn't help our patients, number one, they're going to be out of money. Number two, it's not going to be of benefit um, to them and what we want to do is make them better. Yeah. It, should, it should be about patient-centred treatment. Absolutely. Hear, hear. Janet, thank you so much for once again taking us through your true expertise in caring for patients but also in covering this truly controversial theory, the antioxidant theory, which I think we really need to ditch. We need to evolve it. So, again, thank you once again, Janet. Oh, you're welcome. And I hope that um, I've opened people's minds to reassessment of the antioxidant theory and and they're more than welcome to ask any questions they want. Thanks for having me. This is FX Medicine and I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Mm-hmm.